a lot of people will say that it is wildly unrealistic to expect governments to be able to alter the way people live their lives. They form couples, they break up. On the whole, the history has been the government has gone along, sweeping along behind, trying to accommodate the system to what people have done. People walked away from marriage before there was any, any divorce law reform. Uh, in the end, there had to be divorce law reform to take account of that. What makes you think that governments have this extraordinary power to reach down into the, the most important aspects of people's lives and change the way they behave with a bit of tinkering here and there? I mean, you, after all, uh, come from the party that tends to believe in less government, smaller government, government stepping back from people's lives. Yet the moment you mention family and marriage, all of a sudden you seem to think governments have superhuman powers. Well, I don't. <clears throat> and nothing I've ever said suggests that the government can dictate to people what they do. But I simply say uh, that we come from two different standpoints on this. You take the view that it's all over and that people will simply collapse through this because it's a modern process. I take the view that it's not. Uh, and I take the view... I don't take that view. Well, I take the view that everybody second. wants to be let, happily married let, 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 and it's a very difficult thing to achieve. Well, let me achieve. then complete this process, all right, because you posed this at me and you said governments can't do anything. I don't think governments can dictate to people or tell people what to do, but I think governments can have a very co uh, clear look at what they're doing uh, and ask whether it's negative or whether it's positive to what I call stable family formation. And that's all that we're looking at. And two th very good examples of this. The first is, you know, we are alone in Western Europe and believing somehow that marriage is just another <coughs> family formation, that it isn't relevant, it isn't important. Everybody else out there uh, actually thinks that it's important enough uh, to recognize and celebrate. So we are sort of slightly unique. We're also unique in this that the level of our family breakup is phenomenal. It's way beyond anybody else in Western Europe. We have more uh, families breaking up, we have more lone parents, we have more teenage pregnancies. If we're doing something right, I'd love to know what it was because nobody else wants to copy us. Uh, nobody should be beating a path to our door to find out how you stabilise society. Our teenage pregnancies have been falling. Uh, that, come on, Polly, let's, this is marginal rubbish. The truth is we have an appalling record on all of this and if I was any other country in Western Europe, I would ring fence Britain and say, don't go there, avoid that like the plague because that place teaches you how not to do things. So we need to ask ourselves, to what extent has the government been complicit in some of this? That's all I'm asking, to restabilize things so that people make the choice on a balance. It's not incentivizing, it's getting rid of what I call the disincentives. So what will a married couple get that they don't get now, on average? I, I'm not going to give the <coughs> specifics because that varies and depends on what an incoming government or the present government would want to give them. Our recommendation is that there's a recognition uh, of marriage through the tax system. Our recommendation was a transferable tax system which was kicking around over the last few years. It's nothing new and the levels of those are determined simply by the government coming in how much they want to favour it. But I mean if it's a tiny sum of money it's not going to make any difference. How much money would make a difference well, do you think to people's behaviour? I think money does make a difference to people's behaviour. It may not make a difference to, uh, and this is often reviewed, by the way, by what I would call uh, middle-class uh, commentators who say that amount of money is not going to make a major difference to me, and it may not do. But we forget that on the margins where people uh, really struggle for, and every pound really does count, um, then small amounts of money actually do make a difference, particularly if, uh, as we found with the present system on benefits, uh, where a couple together... Well, let's stick to, let's stick to taxes for the Well, I think let's it's just, all... Let's keep to, but well, I think it's all part of the same process. Well, it's not it's really, because it's very process. different. A tax relief goes to people who are on the whole better off, because they've got to be earning quite a bit of money to get some of that. Uh, I mean, are you talking about, what, £20 a week? Give, give a notion I'm not going to give you... No, Polly, I'm not going to give you figures, because that's not my decision at the end of the day. That requires the government to make well, a decision the, about how much... What's the figure at which you think I'm it after, might make a difference I'm to after ordinary the families? I think almost any money makes a difference, so I'm after the principle being established, first of all, that marriage is recognised within the tax system and that you're not penalised for being together. In other words, if you are a, a couple that is together and a, an individual, particularly, the, let's say the mother, but it could be the father, uh, wanted to make the choice about staying at home for a particular period, then I think that there are good reasons why that is a benefit to society if that's what they choose. So it's an incentive. You, if, if you say, here's, if you go and get, well, go to the an, registry it, it, office and you can cash in and say You can call it an week. incentive or the eradication of a disincentive. Now, what right now, I think there's a real who, disincentive for people to make that choice. But what, what makes you think that people who get married just for the 20 quid a week, any more likely to stay together than if they hadn't got well, married. First of all, now, it's one thing, hang on, it's one thing to <coughs> say, when you look at the statistics, people yeah. who are married tend to stay together more than people who are not. I understand that. But that may be because they're different sorts of people, for one thing. They're 
everybody who's religious. There are all sorts of people who may be uh, a different category of people to those who don't get married. The idea that you can just give them an incentive to go down to the registry well, office if we just is going to make like them that. stay together for life. But if we just did it like that, I wouldn't uh, for one moment think it, uh, it would make any difference. And I've never said that. What I've said is it's part of a whole series of things that you do which stabilize that process and that decision making. First of all, I think when people make that decision to, to marry, once they marry, I think it matters, that piece of paper has a big part to play in it. Um, people say it's only a piece of paper. Actually, it's a very significant piece of paper because it forces people who have difficulty <coughs> problems for the most part to pause and think about this a bit more before they simply just walk out. Uh, and I think it does have an effect and we just did a huge amount of polling on that. And on the margins where people weren't sure when they did, it has stabilized relationships, I'm sure of that. I don't think people just make the decision. You said just for the 20 quid or whatever it happens to be. My answer is if it was just for that, then it wouldn't work at all. Uh, but it is one of the problems that people told us that they faced as they went to marriage. On many occasions, they said they felt that there was a genuine disincentive for them to make that decision. And it gave you know, one of the two the option to say, well, we're going to be worse off if we do this. So on balance, this but is there not isn't a good a idea. There isn't a disincentive to being married. Well, we'll, we'll dispute this. I think there is. But, but the point that I'm saying here is that it's one of a number of things that you do. The other part of it is, and, and arguably even more important, is the failure of uh, this present generation to understand the nature of what they can expect from marriage. Now, what is fascinating from most of the review that we've done and the previous work is that there has never been a higher expectation post-marriage as to what marriage will then be like. Uh, it's almost completely unrealistic, the expectation, which is, as we believe, one of the real problems why in the first two to three years there's a very high level of uh, family breakup uh, post-marriage because nobody can meet those expectations. We've got ourselves to this idea of a fairy tale which simply doesn't exist. If you go back into past generations, there was always an expectation that actually there's a huge amount of compromise and things aren't going to be glorious, but you'll get by. Now there's a sense that you can't get married until everything is sorted out and all the rest after marriage will be brilliant, easy and done for you. What is the social justice justification for uh, this big bonus to a largely middle class, more well-heeled population? Well, I suspect I'm not going to persuade you, but my view about this is it works. If it stabilises and helps stabilise that process to, uh, to marriage, then I think society benefits. And by the way, this isn't in isolation. <clears throat> you said you didn't want to talk about stuff like the couple penalty. But, but I these middle class but, but people aren't going to be a problem to society. Well, They're not going to fall onto social security. They're well, not no, I don't agree with you. I think that's nonsense. I think a number of uh, people who you might describe as middle class but who do not have a lot of money, a lot of those mothers afterwards looking after their kids do cascade down. Their incomes can fall by up to a third. But that's the failure of the fathers to pay. The, failures well, of the failure of the it, CSA, which was but, a good idea, which the Conservatives set up, Polly, you just it's said fathers it, no, 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 not Hold on a second, pay. Polly. You just said it doesn't make a difference. My answer to you is that's not true. You may chase the fathers by all means, you can go after the CSA, but it avoids the simple fact that people on lower income who may describe as being middle class Class, they, when, particularly the women, when they come out of a marriage breakup or a, a, a couple breakup, their income will fall dramatically, which is a tragedy. And the troubles for them are enormous. The state will have to step in in many cases uh, in deeper terms, sometimes not so deeper, but the state will step in. So my point is, it does have an effect, but it's not in isolation. And I keep coming back to this. Our view about this is to support relationships even that aren't married. Couple relationships are as important to us. We hope they will develop into marriage. At least they will stay together and be stable for the sake of the children, as and when children. So our point about the benefit system, rejigging this, so that this couple penalty that exists at the moment, which the IFS... So what are you going to do what are you going to the benefit system then? How, how are you going to make uh, marriage an incentive for people who are living on benefits? Well, actually, we are talking here about trying to slowly eradicate the idea that uh, a couple that is on benefits trying to get into work <coughs> has to work significantly more hours. It's more difficult for them to get into work than at present than a lone parent who gets the various incentives and support. And we think, by and large, that couples should not have that disincentive because what we saw with the IFS figures were that there has been a, a greater level of breakup and split since this arrangement arrived for couples learning quite categorically that it was better for them not to be together, particularly if the man's not in work and the, and the woman's struggling to look after the kids. So we think uh, resolving that is as important as resolving so the issue about marriage. Well, it's about rechanging. 
I'm about to launch a big change to the benefit system in September, which we've been working on with the IFS and with uh, uh, Taxpayers Alliance and various others. And the idea is to simplify the system so that the back-to-work process is an equal process for, for everybody and that we see it in terms of family structures rather than just individuals. In describing uh, this policy, you say you've been working on it together with the Taxpayers Alliance. Well, you, a number of organisations. You several times so. through this mm. talked about how this is really a a tax saving, a ta saving money for the taxpayers as one of its primary objectives. Uh, is that reasonable? Is there really money to be paid here? These are some of the poorest people on the lowest benefits. Is there really money to be saved, do you think, with any compassion? Saved, sorry, from what? I'm, I'm You're really... suggesting that, that, that we're spending much too much on the effects of divorce and the effects of separation on people living on benefits, after yeah. all, very low <clears throat> levels of benefit. They're struggling to get by. And yet you're suggesting that somehow out of this policy, the taxpayer is going to come out uh, better off. Uh, yes, but it's not going to happen in the first year or two years. Of course, the, my way of looking at this is, the, is different at the moment from most of my colleagues. My colleagues will come into this uh, next parliament, Conservative or Labour, uh, and we will have a spitting match <coughs> about um, how much money can be cut or saved from the benefit system. Uh, and I've said constantly and publicly, the biggest problem we have is that we all arrive at the debate from the wrong end of this telescope. The truth, the reason why we have a burgeoning level of demand is because there is a burgeoning level of breakup. So the question is, if you want to save money in the medium and long term, the way to do it structurally is to try and resolve the scale of the breakup that's going on, that's cascading people, mothers onto benefits, kids into difficulty uh, and uh, inter intergenerational unemployment. The way to, in the medium and longer term, to resolve this is to try and get to the root of these problems. And one of the papers that I produced quite recently, which I'm enormously proud of, is the paper I produced with Graham Allen over early years intervention work, which we've looked at what's been going on in places like Colorado and others, where they've spent 25 years getting to mums before the kids are, are born, uh, dealing with them, and then post-birth. Uh, that Does that mean you'll fight, years. you'll fight hard to, to maintain Sure Start and the Early Years Initiative? Actually, because I there's quite a fear that, that that's going to be cut. That you know, it, If you've got a government coming in that's uh, committed to heavy cuts all round, that the under fives will be the losers. Uh, will you stand up against that? Yeah, I think the most important area that we need to uh, look at and safeguard and properly operate is the... Well, really the under fives, the under threes really, the truth is, and pre, pre noughts in other words, the uh, teenage mums all the way through to a child of three, I mean five because that's obviously the moment they go off to school, but the key for me is the first three years. But you said you're out of step with your party. Well, I don't give a damn whether I'm out of step with anybody, frankly, anymore, because I'm just going to say it as I see it, and all the evidence Does I... Does that mean you've got no chance of getting a job under David Cameron, then, because you're too far out to the left? I'm, I'm long past caring whether I got a job or not. I'm, I'm more concerned that I am able to force all politicians to recognise this is almost the most important area of politics, frankly, because it will reshape our society in 15 years' time in a way that we cannot do by intervening with a child who's 14 I couldn't agree more. And we spend in, in inverse it's relation to the Our money we spend 14 to 18 is way higher and we don't spend anything on the early years. So my recommendations are that, first of all, Sure Start, as it was originally set up, was absolutely right. You know, I congratulate that came from America, there's no question about that, and about the definition of how you get to dysfunctional families, because that's the key. Uh, the problem, I think, has been that the government, having started that process, has then added stuff to it which is not necessarily related to what I would call the proper early years intervention for dysfunctional kids. So uh, they've now swamped it with things like childcare, uh, which local authorities free to make these decisions. But if you want to get all these, 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 these mothers back to work and working full time, you're going to need more childcare than there is now. My point about this is childcare is a different issue. It's important in its own right, but it is different from what Sure Start should be about, which is early years intervention and outreach. And these are the sort of mums, as you know, who will never come into anything. You have to find them, you have to get alongside them, and then you have to work with them. They will never turn up to a childcare centre because they just don't turn up to anything. So what Sure Start ultimately must be about is about outreach rather than about waiting for people to come to it. So I, I, my point is that we have created this idea of a thing called the family hub, and I would put this all into the family hub and separate out within that things like childcare and other work, even 
pre But that's what children's stuff. centres are supposed to be, a hub, and it's mostly they what are. they are. We think they should be even more inclusive. So our family hub process is so all about getting rid of something. So you will stand there and fight hard for them to be to, 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 for to the be retained. And, and, and for early and years intervention to be absolutely the, the critical bit. In fact, so much so that Graham and I have been to see uh, Gordon Brown, we've been to see David Cameron, we've been to see Nick Clegg. Um, we want to hold another conference together on this. We think this should be taken out of party politics now. Thank you very much, Ian Duncan-Smith. Pleasure.